Hello, everyone. This is Devan and Serafino, a host of the Sex, Drugs, and Jesus podcast. I, I really appreciate everyone's patience with me as I'm still in the process of releasing the last few episodes that I have left from last year. I believe everything happens exactly when it's supposed to, so thank you so very much for your understanding. Casey Donatello is your friendly local neighborhood hot wife, adult content creator, erotic author who wrote the books In Bed with Strangers, Swinging My Way to Self-Discovery. She also wrote Scarlet Swings Higher, The Sexual Saga Continues, and Scarlet Surrenders, Swinging Into Love. She is also a ghostwriter who can help you write your own book, and she is the host of the In Bed with Strangers podcast. You can find her on OnlyFans, you can find her on FetLife, and now you can find her on the Sex, Drugs, and Jesus podcast, baby. Yes. Take a listen. So even when I first got into it, it was so overwhelming. I'm going to lifestyle clubs. I'm eating all these people. Like, you are just surrounded by nakedness and sex and fetish and, like, all these crazy things are happening. So it didn't take long until I was just, like, totally consumed by this world well interesting because after spending so many years single and having like these unattached experiences when i started dating my husband i had a very hard time and having like normal intimate sex with him it freaked me out and he was like what the fuck is wrong with you i hope you enjoy that appetizer now get ready for the main chorus Hello, 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 all you delicious and magical truffles out there. Welcome back to the Sex, Drugs, and Jesus Christ of Nazareth podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Devannon. I have with me the lovely, sexy, and multifaceted, multi-talented Jesus Christ take the motherfucking will, Casey Donatello. What a cool-ass last name, Donatello. I, I am giving you Ninja Turtles, because you're giving me... <laughs> Often do you need a fucking Donatello. Are you like a mafia boss, bitch? Or do you need to do no. a conversation after we get up? <laughs> no, nothing to worry about here. That was a lovely intro, though. My God, I'm so flattered. Hells yeah, y'all. Casey's, I mean, just to, to kind of to wrap it up, a love and life coach. However, however, you can also find her over on OnlyFans under Hot Wife Life 869. Her website is CaseyDonatello.com. This this woman has about as many damn jobs as I do. <laughs> she right. Got to stay busy. You got to stay hustling. A hustler's work is never through. She is working on the In Bed podcast, which is upcoming, right? Yes. Forthcoming. She does virtual sessions, fetish sessions. She has her OnlyFans. She teaches other people how to live. She does lifestyle guidance. And everything, and I'm gonna let her go into more details about that. So basically, this woman has found her balance, giftings, and callings, and now she's also humble enough to help other people do the same thing. Casey, how are you today? I'm doing so great. Finally got together. I'm so excited. Can we get together? Oh, I better stop singing Madonna. I don't know. Get all gay and shit as I am, but. So a quick shout out to Dr. Darian Parker from the Dr. D social network uh, website and podcast. His website is drdarianparker.com. And that is how I met this beautiful, lovely, talented individual sitting right here in front of me. Hey, Dr. Darian, how are you? Love you. Hey, hey, hey. So tell us about life in your own words, your history and whatever it is you want to fucking say about yourself. So it's really interesting how I became very out in the public now about being in the lifestyle, about having an alternative relationship and having an OnlyFans and all these things, because many, many years ago when I was younger, this is the complete opposite of anything that I would ever imagine I was doing. I was very shy about sex. I was very uncomfortable with sex and like nudity I did go to Catholic school. I wasn't raised in like a really crazy strict family. But, you know, after you go to Catholic school for most of your life, you are given these ideas that, you know, sex before marriage is bad. It's a sin. Masturbation is bad. Porn is bad. Just everything is not OK. That is fun in life, you know. And I remember also being 
very aware that there was this double standard where guys could, you know, have all the sex they want and it was great. But then girls were, you know, trashy, slutty whores if they wanted to be promiscuous. And I just had all of these conflicting, you know, battles going on in my head because I wanted to be this slutty girl, but I was so nervous to be this slutty girl. And then eventually I stumbled upon the lifestyle and little by little, I started to meet people and get exposed to this community where it was okay to be like this. But at the same time, it was okay to be like that in the lifestyle, but not, you know, openly in your everyday life. You still have to have these two sides to you where you can be free in the lifestyle, but in your vanilla life, you want to still be, you know, respectable and classy. So you have these two worlds that you're battling between. And I found it very hard to try to date and have a relationship knowing that I wanted to be out there, you know, fucking everybody <laughs> that I could and be going to, you know, parties and doing all this crazy shit. But you don't want to admit that to a new guy that you just met because you don't want to be judged. So eventually I ended up marrying someone that I met in the lifestyle. And through being with him, it really made me confident and just not give a fuck anymore because he married me the way I am. We're both doing this, you know, crazy sex life style together. And when you have somebody by you, it makes it way less scary to talk about it and have other people know this about you. But if he's proud to be married to me and I'm like this, there's really no reason to be embarrassed about it. And I'm 41 now. Like, I don't understand why sex is such a big deal. And it's so embarrassing to talk about. And people hide their kinks and their fetishes. You know, if if you don't care, then other people can't shame you anymore. And that was the reason that I ended up doing OnlyFans, because I just wanted to take that power into my old hand, my own hands and just be like, fuck it. I really have nothing left to hide. I don't care. My face is there. My husband's face is there. You know, we really are living out loud and proud now. And it's so exciting and refreshing and liberating. And I absolutely love it. I wish I did this a long time ago. Yeah, your husband has nice nipples, by the way. My husband's very attractive. <laughs> As love <are> him. <laughs> Maybe the three of us will have to hang out sometime. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, hey. So much, so much, so much, so much, so much there. Yes. Did you have a profession before you became OnlyFans? Before you yeah, I used to be a chef like a long time ago. And then I just, it was so much. It was exhausting. It was overwhelming, like physically and mentally. And I just, I don't know, it just sucked the life out of me. And I found that I was not really enjoying life anymore. I was working too hard. I had no life. And... I don't know. I just kind of had like an early midlife crisis, I guess. And I just fucking left the industry. And ever since then, I've just been doing random like jobs and gigs. It wasn't all sex related. It was just like normal random jobs where I could freelance and have work life balance. And then uh, last year, my husband and I were talking and for some reason, it just felt like the right time to have an OnlyFans page. And now all these other jobs have stumbled upon me through that. And now I am full time in, you know, the adult lifestyle industry, I guess you could say. But we did not plan this. It just kind of fell into my lap and we are going with it. It's been a crazy roller coaster. And it's funny because I probably dedicate as much time to my sex related jobs as I did to the kitchen, but I'm so much happier doing this job than my old job like I don't feel like this is work anymore I love doing this I live it 24 7 I work it 24 7 so I and they say if you do what you love it's not work and that's exactly how I feel about it I feel so happy and blessed that I can do something this fun and creative with my life like finally hallelujah finally I yeah. I I feel you on all of that. You know, I've I've been in the service industry from, you know, working in the, you know, as a buster, as a bartender, server, delivery food driver. Service industry is very damn toxic. Hmm? There's a lot of bitter 
people, I mean, besides the like, stupidly long hours that you work, it's something, there's this spirit of oppression that is there when you're dealing with people who feel like you have to do what they say, especially here in the United States, there's still this whack ass tipping system that they have, mm -hmm. but it creates this environment where it's like the restaurant workers kind of can turn or totally fucking turn against the, the customers because they're angry and shit. Mm -hmm. And it's just nasty. And, and I don't fool with it anymore either because of the energy. Everything is energy. I heard you when you say like the church restricted everything that was fun. I grew up Pentecostal. And yeah, the masturbation was the thing that I was like, I'm like, why the hell can I like wank my fucking dick? Because you told me not to have sex with anyone, not to masturbate. I cannot pray blue balls away. I mean, I could, but the Lord. Yeah, they don't give you any like alternatives or any options. They just roll out every single thing and i remember you're a young kid and in catholic school we had to go to confession and they'd give you this pamphlet of all the potential sins you may have you know um d um done and you would have to go tell this random old guy face to face and i'm just like what this is so awkward and uncomfortable and we always lied like no one actually tells the truth you know because you're not going to go in there and admit all these dirty things to some man that's at least how i feel about it but there was just always this just shame around it and having to wait till you're married to have sex i never understood that one i don't think sex is for procreation only me and my husband are proud to not have children and we have a shitload of sex and i don't understand why one is like mixed up with the other i think that's so crazy the Catholic Church, like all religions, seek to control. I was once a, at a seminary in Houston, Texas, the Houston Graduate School of Theology. I don't even consider this to be shade because it's true. One of the professors was like, yes, we want to control the congregation. And I was the only person in there going, no, we should not be controlling the congregation. But they lead into it with that. It's not, you know, movies like The Golden Compass and things like that all talk about this. Books like Dune, you know, the, you know, and all of that. Is about that very thing. The Catholic Church is bullshit. And I, I encourage everyone to leave it because it is not about the Catholic Church is about the people, it's not about Christ. You know, you don't need a human to stand in between you and the Lord that was already done and accomplished. The Catholic Church is about ritual, control, and getting you distracted with everything, but actually an intimate personal relationship with the Lord. So I stand against the Catholic Church. And it's unfortunate because so many people I talk to have been damaged by that church. And it's like a whole fucking shit show when they leave it and try to get disentangled from the religious trauma and the mental health trauma that they leave it with. So I'm very, very sorry that you had to go through that. I am happy you found your freedom. When I Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I'm definitely not Catholic. I have not been Catholic since I was a teenager. I don't identify with anything. I don't know if I'd be more atheist or agnostic at this point. But I don't believe in any actual religion. I just believe in karma and you should be a nice person just because, like, that's it. It's very simple to me. Right. Having a conscience is a good thing. And understanding that we all will reap what we sow is mm -hmm. very interesting. Um, you know, it's like, like, you know, a lot of people have that innate sense there, even if they don't have any kind of relationship with God or religion or anything. You know, there's some very, very good people such as yourself, who oh, I feel like exhibit a lot of the Christian qualities, even though you don't fuck with it or anything like that, mm -hmm. more than the people who go to church. It's like, it's like yeah. you're more like Christ-like than the church go. It's like, what the fuck? Yeah, I'm the same way. And I don't want to like shit on anybody that's listening to this that, that's really religious, but I don't believe in the same thing, like going through another person to be religious or going to a special building to be like, if you are religious, it should just be within you and you are religious all the time, not just because there's so many Catholics that are only Catholic on Sunday or Easter or Christmas and the rest <laughs> of the year, they're total assholes, you know, so. You're right. You're not wrong about that. I don't I like you said, I don't try to shit on anybody who feel like they have to go to the big building to, to see the big to be the fucking preacher on stage. But it's unnecessary. It's completely unnecessary. But. It's just that you have you have some people that are like true. And if we talk about Catholic, like true Catholics, they, you know, live by the Bible and they do the right thing. And yes, they go to church and, all, and that's fine. But then you have these other people that pretend to be religious 
but just go once or twice a year and call themselves Catholics, but don't actually, you know, like follow any of the commandments or any of the ways that Jesus would like you to be. And that's what I have a problem with. There's so many hypocrites about religion. I guess that's what I don't like. It sure in the hell is. And we all just because you check those boxes going to church and high-fiving Sister Susie and shit that don't mean that you live in right. Stop mm -hmm. looking at yourself. Um, so I, when I got out disentangled, when I left the Pentecostal, or when I left to go to the military and I had some freedom, you know, though I was still technically Pentecostal, I began to explore sexually and everything and really took it way out of control because I went from being super restricted coming from Baton Rouge. That's what happens though. So, so you mentioned the word slut a lot. I want to bring clarity in between what the fuck sex positivity is versus destructive sexual behavior. Like I need to, I need to, I need to clarify that there is a difference because some people might hear this and think, oh, I can just go sleep with whoever I want, however I want, and whatever the case may be. That when so when she says slut in the fetish world, that the word slut is not used in the same meaning. Cause I'm on like fetlife.com and I'm gonna get dabble in the in, in the realm of society that takes a very disciplined, structured approach to sex, even though there may be a lot of it for some people, it's not for me. But, you know, I'm looking into it, you know, for education at this point. So when you say, I, I need you to explain to people like a healthy sexual exploration versus not healthy. Well, so, okay, female empowerment is very big for me. I mean, sexual empowerment for everybody, but especially as a girl, because that's the stuff that I struggled with mostly. There is a fine line between being empowered and violated, being proud of what you're doing versus feeling used by what you're doing. And most of it comes from basically like how you feel and what your intentions are and what your motivations are. I fuck a lot of people because I enjoy it. It turns me on. I like it. I'm in control of it. I don't fuck a lot of people so that I will be popular or I will be liked or, you know, so it's kind of the reason that you're doing. If you're doing it for reasons that are positive to you, then it's empowering. If you are doing it out of like desperation or to try to save a relationship or things like that, then you go the other route where it's not helpful to you anymore. And if you call yourself a slut, it's like a badge of honor. But, you know... It depends how other people are calling you a slut. It could be degrading or it could be flattering. So it really depends who you're with and how it's being used. I heard you when but, you said... Oh, go ahead. No, as I say, but there is this movement now where women are taking back the word slut and they're embracing it and it is nothing to be ashamed of because people always want to sleep, shame you for being a slut. But if you're not ashamed of it, then there's no shame in it, if that makes any sense at all. Right. I can get behind the no shame, squaring that with how you said about intentions, intentions, mm -hmm. everything and everything that you just said revolves around people knowing who they are. Yes. That is a huge thing in this world in general, but especially if you're going to start dabbling and mixing energies with people through sex and things like that, you got to first know who you are and why you're going about the business of doing it. So since there is a lot of sex in everything, do you feel like, you know, in the world that you live in and in the fet life world that people with sex addictions can get lost in this world? Absolutely. Absolutely. You need. So even when I first got into it, all of this was so brand new to me and it was so overwhelming. I'm going to lifestyle clubs. I'm meeting all these people like you are just surrounded by nakedness and sex and fetish and like all these crazy things are happening. And I already have an addictive personality. I know that for a fact. So it didn't take long until I was just like totally consumed by this world. And I was going out all the time. I was meeting people all the time, like constantly. This was my life. And when it starts to affect your real world, where like you're not hanging out with your regular friends or your family or, you know, you're not doing things you're supposed to be doing in your daily life. You have to take a step back and go, oh, shit, like I need to rein it back in a little bit. I need to control myself. And once I got over that initial, like the high feeling of all this sex and stuff going on, 
Because before that, when I was younger, I did do a lot of drugs. And once I stopped doing drugs, you kind of need something to fill the void. And then I found this crazy world of sex. And I was like, oh, this will do this will do the job. I could like go overboard in this. But you want everything in balance. You never want to lose sight of what's important and who you are to live out these fantasies and stuff like that. So after, you know, the first year or probably or something like that, I was like, okay, that first initial wave of craziness is gone. And now I need to do this in a responsible way and a mature way and a way that is bringing something positive to my life and not, you know, having a negative effect on me. And now everything is good with me. I'm totally in control of everything that's happening. And I I wouldn't say I'm a sex addict because people always ask me that. I have an addictive personality, but I am not a sex addict because I say no to a ton of sex. My husband and I, you know, take breaks from playing in the lifestyle for extended periods. Our vanilla life always comes before the lifestyle. We're very careful with that now. So it just takes a little time to find that sweet spot. And, you know, for some people, some couples might only play once a month. Some couples might play twice a week. It really depends on who you are, what your relationship is like, what you are looking to get out of it. So there's no, you know, just basic template like you should do this. You should do this this often. It really is trial and error for people. But if you ever feel like you are kind of getting overwhelmed by it, just take a break, step step away from it. It's always going to be there. You can always go back to it. But your sanity and your peace of mind is very important. You don't want to lose that while you're trying to have fun. Right. Some people really act like they can't go out, go without sex or whatever their creature comforts are, you know, and it's, it's really quite sad because the only things we have to have in this life are like air, food water and clothing, everything else is like literally negotiable and you don't have to have it, even though it's good. And if it's hurting you, then stepping away for as long as you need to is the responsible adult and mature thing to do. The other thing that I found to be a bit of a struggle in the beginning was when you're in the lifestyle, a lot of the lifestyle is based on like NSA sex, random hookups, you know, you're just meeting people for sex. Not that you can never be friends with them and stuff like that, but generally speaking, it is, you know, no strings, no emotions involved and stuff like that. So when I started having all the sex with all these different people and you weren't supposed to have your emotions involved, it starts to feel a little like hollow and empty, especially when I was single. Because now you're just giving and giving and giving a part of you and you're not really getting that, I don't know, something special part back. That if you were in love with someone or you were dating someone, you would get back. So I struggled with that a little bit when I was single. Now that I have a partner, it's a lot easier because I get all of that intimacy, all of that love, all the affection, you know, the cuddling, the hand holding from him. And then we're able to still go out and do all this crazy stuff on dates. But now I have balance. And for someone like me, I need that other part. I need that intimacy. Or you start to feel lonely. You start to just feel like, what is the point? Like, you know, other people might love that. They don't want any attachment. But it was very complicated in the beginning to separate feelings from sex because I was used to having very long-term relationships and being monogamous. So your brain needs to adapt. And some people handle it very well. Some people don't handle it so well. So even with that, you need to figure out where you fall on that scale and learn what your limits are, what your boundaries are, what your expectations for people are. You know, I had some friends that we were definitely weren't dating, but we were hooking up for years. So you get a little closeness from that person, but you still can't cross that line into relationship. You know, so some people have no kissing rules, no cuddling rules when they're on play dates. Other people don't care. It really is open to interpretation. And that's the really the coolest part about the lifestyle, I think, is that it really becomes what you want it to be. And everybody's journey is going to be different. I've had people read my books and they go, oh, that book was horrible. That's not what swinging is to me. No, that's what it was for me, not for you. 
my books are like a diary. They're my story. They're not telling you what to go out and do. You know, no one ever said that. But people can't understand that if you're not in the lifestyle in the same way that they're in it, then you're doing it wrong. And that's not true. There's so many variations now and ways to be in the lifestyle. You know, originally swinging was couples and couples only, like back in the day. Now you have all these variations. You have poly people. You have like ethically non-monogamous. You have triads. You have throuples. You know, you have all different gender identities, all different sexual identities. And it really is, you know, you have the fetish world, the BDSM world. This is all in the lifestyle and you are allowed to be as mild or as wild as you want to be. There is no, like no textbook for this. It, it literally is a journey and it's always changing. I am not the same person I was when I started in the lifestyle. I'm not the same as I was five years ago in the lifestyle. You're always evolving and that's the beauty of it. You can decide, hey, I don't want to do this anymore or hey, I want to try that but I didn't want to try it before, but now I'm ready. You know, and you meet these new people and they open your mind up to different things. And it really is amazing how from sex, you really do learn so much about yourself and you grow in this crazy way. And even my husband and I got into nudism now. And that's another empowering thing. Like being able to strut around butt naked and socialize with people in a non-sexual environment was very hard at first. It's weird. And people always say, oh, but I'm not hot enough to go to a nudist place. I go, it's not even about that. No one cares what you look like. It's just the ability to be confident and be free and be liberated and just hang out naked. It's one of the most fun things I think we do now. Like we absolutely love it. We go nude camping all the time. And to be naked in a non-sexual environment can really mess with your head at first. You have like nothing to fidget with. You can't fix anything when you're nervous. But I truly believe that when you're naked, everybody kind of feels like they're equal. You can't judge people. You can't assume anything about people. There's kind of this like equality that's happening when everybody is already naked and you become more like friendly. You let your guard down a little bit. And I think it's something that everybody should try at least one time. Right. I'm going to circle back to that. I want to, I want to ask about like, in, in terms of like, you, so you have your stable relationship, which is super great. And so y'all are experimenting, experiencing different things with different people. Do you feel like that you respect everybody that you have sex with? I try to. The intention is to going into it, but you can't control the outcome of all your dates. And just because you think you know, via texting or a website, you guys are going to hit it off. Some people are assholes when you meet them and it's doesn't always go well. But even if the sex is horrible, if the person is nice, then I absolutely respect them. We try to make the best of a worse of a bad situation. You know, we try to always be respectful of people's feelings because, you know, having sex with someone is a big deal, even if we act like it's not a big deal because we are so sexually active. Like every person I have sex with, I take seriously. Whether or not people think I do, I absolutely do. Because every time you have sex with someone, you are giving them a part of you. You know, it's a, a different amount for different people, but it, it does matter and it does add up and it does have this impact on you after a long time. And I think the fact that we're all in this lifestyle and we're trying to live out these fantasies and explore together, you need to be respectful of each other because some people all need a little more guidance. Some people are unsure what they need. You know, if you're trying something new with someone, it there might be some problems or awkward situations that arise and you don't want to embarrass anybody, you know? And so as long as the guy is not an asshole, then we're very nice to them. Once in a while, you meet a guy that is rude and vulgar, and I have no problem telling him how I really feel about that because that is not the right attitude to come at somebody with in the lifestyle. It's not about that. Right. I, that, that, that all sounds like clarity to me. Everything you're talking about has to do with being conscious in, in, with, the sec, with all the sexual exploration. So much of the world today seems to run on autopilot 
especially like mm. with, with hookup apps and things like that. It's like it's just square, click, thin nudes, go get naked, rinse, wash, repeat. It's not, there's no like emotion. There's no intent. There's no like, and people literally don't care about the people they sleep with. Tell me what you think about this. I was in New York the other week talking to across, across the little pond from you because y'all, she's up there north of Joy Z, north Joy Z, talking to this girl who 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 is who I think is a sex addict, and she was telling me how she's you know how she's not very happy, but she likes to have a lot of sex with people. She's like on the witchy scale, and so when she has sex with people, she intentionally imagines that she's siphoning energy out of them yeah. in order to drain them which get, makes her feel strong it leaves them infatuated with her and then she per her word says she doesn't give a fuck about the people she sleeps with and she does it regularly and so how do you shield yourself from coming across someone like that and what do you think about people who will go and get naked and go through all the rituals to sleep with people and in their head be like I don't give a fuck about that person I mean, you can't control people from being like that. But, I mean, sometimes within a few interactions before meeting someone, you can kind of get a vibe. Like, okay, and this is what people find very fascinating. I fucked hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. I love anonymous sex. I love random hookups. But if a guy's first message to me is a dick pic or something really graphic and vulgar, I don't answer that message. And people go, why does that offend you? I go, because it's the approach. Just because I am, you know, this like huge like slaughter or whatever, which is fine, you still need to treat me with some kind of respect. And people in the lifestyle, sometimes when they're new, they don't understand that this is a world based on respect and etiquette and you are not entitled to anything. Just because I'm on a swinger site or a sex site does not mean you are entitled to fuck me. I can still say no to whoever I want. And I don't need a reason to say no to you other than the fact that my answer is no. So that's how you feel it out by people, the way they respond to you, the way they approach you. You know, sometimes you politely say no to someone and they start begging you like nonstop. And that's a weird one. Like move on to somebody else or they get angry and then they start saying rude, obnoxious things because I won't fuck them. Like, it's very easy for me at this point because I've been doing it for so long to kind of spot the people I don't want to associate with. But once in a while, obviously, somebody slips through the cracks that you shouldn't have met. But I would say that's the biggest thing for people that are curious about the lifestyle is that you really need to have respect in this world. You should treat people like you would in the vanilla dating world. But just know that we are more open minded and, you know, sex is a bigger part of our agenda, but we are still regular people and you still need to have some kind of class and consideration when, you know, you deal in the lifestyle. If not, it's just like trashy and weird and I don't like that part about it. This isn't like a free for all where you just get to do whatever you want. You still have to meet the right people, find the right pieces. And it's actually a lot of work and very time consuming to find the right people. It could, you know, I could spend all day looking for one person sometimes. And that's what makes it more serious for us versus somebody that doesn't care. If I didn't care, I would just open an email and say, fine, you're next on my list. But I don't. I search for people that I think we are going to be compatible with, that I think we're going to have good energy with, that our vision of a sexual experience will align with. For example, you know, a lot of people think sex is sex and that's it. You have a hookup and you're done. But at this point in our relationship, and like we've both been in the lifestyle a long time, my husband and I, we want specific kinds of dates. We want a specific kind of experience and an outcome. So we really take our time to look for those people. Like we love hardcore, nasty, graphic, like porn sex. We don't want to meet people that want to have romantic sexual sex. Not going to work with us. So, you know, people have to understand that people want different things out of sex and you need to find the proper people. If not, it just becomes a mess and a disaster. And then you are just having sex for the sake of sex versus having sex to have this intense experience and, you know, 
have something happen from it. There's a very big difference to me. And other people might disagree. They might feel like it's all the same. You just fuck people and that's it. But I think there's a very big distinction. I think people self just self-deceive themselves when they try to reduce sex to just a physical action. I take a more spiritual side to it. I always say God invented sex. It's a spiritual, energetic exchange, emotional exchange, whether you think it is or not. And humans don't have a right to change that. What you're saying is along those same lines, it, it to the extent, or at least it runs parallel to it in the sense that it's not just two husks with flesh, flesh bumping together. Like there's so much more at play mm -hmm. and it matters who the other person is. Do you have sex to make you happy or are you already happy and the lifestyle you live is an extension of that happiness? Maybe in the beginning, I was having sex to be happy. Now I'm having sex because I'm so happy and I can't, can't contain myself. <laughs> I just need to have sex. But there is a very big difference because in the beginning, I was figuring myself out. I didn't even know what I liked. I was just, you know, and I actually started in the lifestyle with a different guy. And it started because, like, he wanted to meet other girls to play with and stuff. So I did a little bit of that. And then along the way, I realized that I'm very straight and I don't want to be doing that part. So when I became single, eventually I focused on, like, groups of guys and multiple guys. And I was like, oh, now I really love this. Like, this is definitely what I'm supposed to be doing <laughs> and how I should be spending my free time versus I'm doing this because my partner wants to do this or because... I want to make my partner happy. I don't want them to break up with me. And I feel obligated to do this. I also don't think, you know, it's funny because my husband and I talk sometimes about, because I'm very big on consent, especially in the lifestyle. Consent can be tricky, right? Because you're meeting people to fuck them, but you can still say no whenever you want. It's not guaranteed. And some people think by meeting them for a drink off the website, like, you're a done deal. And that is not true. You can walk away from anything at any point. But even in a relationship, like I'm married, but my husband still kind of needs consent to fuck me. Like, obviously, he's not going to ask me every single time, but I am allowed to say no to my husband if I'm if I don't want to have sex or I'm not in the mood or if I don't like what he wants to do to me. And I think sometimes that gets tricky because you feel like you need to keep your partner happy and you need to do what they want so they don't cheat on you. You know, it could get a little complicated where you are having sex for the wrong reasons versus you're having sex to, like, make your connection stronger. That's different than doing it to save a relationship. So there's everything is a fine line with sex. You know, you put you just push a little too hard and it goes from a good thing to a bad thing. You switch one little thing, it could go from a bad thing to a good thing. But it really is all about, how we said before, like your intention and your motivation. and I think people really need to spend more time thinking about what they're doing and why they're doing it. And I think they'd be in a much healthier headspace for that. So this is not a world for people to get into if they don't know who the fuck they are because they're going to get lost. I mean, you don't have to know exactly who you are because that is the point. Right? It's a journey. You are searching and stuff, but you need to have some kind of stability and be able to stay grounded while you're figuring out who you are. You know, you need, I didn't, if you have like a support system or there's somebody you could talk to, because it's hard when you're in the lifestyle, you don't want to tell your friends. You're embarrassed. You don't want them to judge you. They think you're weird. So if you can find someone you can talk to, whether they're in the lifestyle or vanilla friend, or you're doing it as a couple, it's a lot easier sometimes because you can balance each other out. You can be like, okay, we need to take a break. What do you need? When you're a couple, there's a lot of aftercare that goes into a play date. When you're single, you miss out on that. So you don't need to know who you are, but you just need to be logical enough to know, <laughs> you know, how you're, how you're doing. And if you're doing a good job or you're fucking it up and you need to like work on some things and that's okay. It's being in on this journey. It's all about like obstacles and problems and how you deal with them and how you grow from them like but that's about life in general right like you learn from the hard times you don't really learn from the good times as much right you right. have fun in the good times but when something goes wrong or when you're feeling down about something or you're struggling internally that's when you really have to reflect on yourself and say okay why am i feeling like this 
what do I need to do different? What's happening? You know, and that's how you really grow. And then you figure out, okay, this isn't working. I think that would be a better path. And then you can eventually find happiness, you know, that way. But it really just is paying attention to the signs and being self-aware, I would say, you know. Right. So you've mentioned a couple of times, like meeting somebody like for drinks first or whatever the case may be. So is that the way that that you usually go about it? You meet in a public space first. Do you ever just go over to the person's house? I do everything. In the very beginning, I only met at a bar first to make sure. And then you go to play right after. Some people meet for a drink, but then they will set up a second date to play if they like you. We've been doing this for so long, like, we don't do that. Like, if we're setting time aside, our intention is to play. So we're going to play on the first date if we hit it off. But I also love going straight to people's hotel rooms. You know, when I was single, I did go straight to people's houses. I had them come to my house. I've tried every option out there. But generally, me and my husband, we do meet at a bar and then, like, go to a hotel or something. If we know that if we've met the people before, then we'll go straight to the hotel. Uh, I'm a little more daring than my husband because that that part turns me on, like the anonymous part. But he really prefers to meet the people before we play. So we compromise on that. But y'all are always together, right? Yes, I am. So I'm in the hot wife category. So like he shares me with other guys and he has no problem if I want to go out on my own, but I don't want to like. So we're considered stag and vixen. He's always with me. But that's for us, that's the fun part is experiencing it together. I don't want to go on a date and then come back and have to tell him about it. Like it could be hot, but I'd rather him be there firsthand to not miss anything. And also people think it's kind of crazy to be at the point where not only is your partner sharing you, like he's watching me fuck other guys, but he's holding my hands. He's holding my hair. We're saying I love you when another guy's inside me. Like it is so crazy for people to think that you could get to a place where like that's a romantic moment like watching your wife get fucked but it totally is you know and then we have all these protocols for like aftercare and to make sure that we stay on track because you never want being in the lifestyle to interrupt your relationship that's the last thing you want right like he is the most important thing to me all of this other stuff is fun and even though we respect our dates like they don't matter at the end of the day my relationship matters you know and you need to keep that in mind. You and your partner always need to be talking, always need to be communicating. Uh, you need to be on the same page. If one person isn't feeling it, you shouldn't be doing it. You know, you have to really take your bond seriously because the point is to make your bond stronger, not to damage it. And it's very easy to damage it. What I love is that you have the option to do something, which is to go out by yourself and you're not using it. I think that it's a beautiful thing that even though you could, you're you're showing that you're still putting your husband first. Having options and not using them is something that it's it seems like it's so hard for me to get through to this current generation because it seems like everybody's like, hey, I have this option. Clearly, I have to use it. And I'm like, no, you don't. It's, it's a very beautiful thing to be able to do something and choose not to. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Well, what's really hilarious is we've been together for four years now. When we first met, we were both in the lifestyle. And I said, hey, listen, I want to be a hot wife that goes out, fucks guys, comes home, fucks my husband. You know, and he's like, I don't like that idea at all. And then four years later, he's the one going, I think you should go out and fuck someone and come home to me. And I'm like, but I don't want to go without you. You know, like I would miss him too much. We are so into each other. But our that's what I mean, like our ideas of our relationship completely flipped from how we first met. We both, you know, changed our views, but we meet in the middle now. And he's like, fine, like, I'll be everywhere with you. That Like, I can't imagine doing something without him there. Like, it would just not be fun. I love the fact that that's so romantic and cute and lovely and adorable. I, I love the fact that you understand that the extracurricular things that you do with other people are never supposed to take the place of the relationship. You're supposed to schedule time with your partner and always make it a priority. And even in the midst of the sex session that y'all are having, you're still strengthening that bond. What do you have to say though about like safety? So you said that you used to go by yourself 
people still get hurt going out on hookups to this day and time. Yep. Speak to me about the safety implications, but at the end of the day, you don't really know the people you're going to go meet if it's the first time, especially. You don't, but we're on sites where people get verified or they get like reviews from other users and stuff. So we only meet people that have some kind of credential. It's still not 100%. Obviously, something can always go wrong, but we try to limit the risk by meeting people that we know met other people. We also meet a lot of guys through guys that we know. There's this weird concept that we'll meet a guy and then like he wants to bring his friends next time. So you verify them through other people. Nothing is ever 100% safe. It is much safer now that my husband's always there versus when I was single. I never, you know, you can also treat a lifestyle date as a vanilla date and tell one of your friends where you are, not say it's a lifestyle date. Just say, hey, I'm going out with this guy that I met online, you know, on a vanilla site, lie, whatever you need to do so that someone knows where you are. A lot of stuff is gut feeling, though. Like, if you think something feels off, fucking leave. Don't feel pressure to stay because you went on a date with somebody. And there have been so many times where I didn't sleep with the person because something, you just had this vibe. Like, they said something weird or you don't like their energy. And it used to be weird at first for me because I'd be like, oh, fuck, I have to turn them down. And now I don't care. Like, if I don't like you for some reason, not doing it. Doesn't matter why. And people need to understand that. Like, you don't always need to know why you have this voice in your head telling you it's not a good idea. I mean, but just like vanilla dating, obviously, like you said, something could happen. But I don't really see our lifestyle being more dangerous than the vanilla lifestyle the way we run it. You know, if if you're just hooking up with random people from all these apps without thinking twice about it, yeah, you're probably putting yourself at risk. You know, so you want, again, it's about being smart, trying to minimize the bad things that can happen. And the lifestyle community is interesting because when you live in an area, it's like word of mouth. A lot of people know the same people and word spreads. So if there's been people that have messaged me and I won't meet them because someone told me something I didn't like about them. Whether or not it's true, I don't even give a shit. But if there's an inkling that they had a bad situation with that person, why would I even go near it? Like there's so many other people to meet. Why would I risk putting myself in a dangerous situation to have a hookup? Like it just doesn't make sense to me. So I don't know. But a lot of people in the lifestyle are really nice people. They're normal. They have amazing careers and jobs and they're interesting. And we just do this as, I don't know, something we love to do. It's an extension of us, but we're not out there, you know, like horny and desperate, just like willing to fuck anything. You get those people, but those aren't real lifestyle people. Those are people that are confused about what's happening here and they're trying for the easy sex, but it's really easy to spot them usually, you know? So it's a complicated question. You can't be 100% safe all the time, but you can try to be as safe as you can be. If that's a good answer, I don't know. Oh, it's pristine, darling, pristine. And what I'm hearing in between, like in your relationship with your husband is that y'all have 100% transparency and 100% honesty. There are no secrets. Nope. But we've been together four years. It was not like that first year that we met. And people are always surprised because we were both in the lifestyle when we met. So they thought it would be like, Oh, no brainer. They should be together. It was fucking hard at first because we had different experiences in the lifestyle. We were on different paths in the lifestyle. And to then mend hours to meet in the middle was really fucking hard. We used to argue all the time about stuff. And it took so much communication and honesty and having really awkward, painful conversations about things that you don't want to have with your partner. And it really did help. And now we're at the point where nothing is embarrassing and awkward to talk about, you know? So it really, it comes down to communication and honesty and trust. You have to have faith that you can tell your partner things and they're not going to judge you. You can tell them things you don't want to do. They're not going to force you. You know, it really has to be an equal partnership. And if you don't have that, that comfort with that partner, then you need to either get it or leave them. (laughs) Yeah. And there's so many couples in the lifestyle where you can obviously tell one person is forcing the other person to do like, you know, or they're leading it and you're just like, nope, we're not going to deal with you. Like, this is awkward. Nope. You know, heck, I'm 
I don't know. I'm so like comfortable talking about everything. And I, I, I think being homeless broke me of the, of the whatever pride and ego that I had before. Because I'm super comfortable talking about every fucking thing about myself. So once we're talking about relationships, let me just go on ahead and put this plug out here for myself. You know, you all know I'm single as of the beginning of this year. And, you know, I've done enough healing. I've done the mind work, the meditation work. I've done the ayahuasca. I've done the psilocybin. I've done the, the meditation with the shamans and everything to exercise the demons. And so, yeah, if anyone's listening and you have a clear spirit and you know who you are and a clear conscious do hit me up. Yes. And, <laughs> and, and so the nudism without sexual intent, I just want to say, I think that that's very, very, it hits at the heart of like fet life, you know, the, the whole fetish and kink world which is not the same as random, just mm -hmm. sex. It is all about discipline, respect, boundaries, self-control, actually. As much as you're willing to do, it's as much about not doing as doing and knowing why you're doing what you're doing. And the nudism without sexual intent, I think, is the perfect example of that. You know, it's all there in front of you and you could, but everybody's making a conscious choice to focus on something else right now, something, a different sort of thing that's constructive. And I think it's just beautiful discipline. Yeah, there's so many people that are comfortable being naked having sex. But they are not comfortable being naked doing other things. Like when we go camping, we play tennis, we go bike riding, we go hiking. You know, you're doing all of these things. You're jumping around. You're like moving your body in weird ways where now like your stomach looks fat, your boobs are sagging, you know, and it doesn't matter. It's fine. Like there's no big deal. It's very freeing once you cannot worry about how you look because you have to remember Everybody else at that nude place is experiencing the same thing as you. You know what I mean? And that's when it becomes powerful. You look at someone that may be a few sizes bigger than you. And you're like, wow, they're walking around with their head held high. Like I can too. Or, you know, and I'm not saying like a certain body type or, sh or size or anything is better than the other. But every time you feel like there's something wrong with you, there's somebody else who feels that way too. And they're dealing with it. They're working through it. And you use that as motivation. You don't have to be a perfect size. You don't have to be a supermodel. You don't have to be young. You know, you get people of all ages, all body types, and you are all treated equally. And that's the really nice part about it. Absolutely. fucking -lutely. So I have one more question that we'll mm -hmm. talk about three books, then we'll do the three dad jokes. So thank you for going a little bit over time with me. Oh, I'm sorry. I Once know. I start talking, I get very chatty. So no, no, I'm saying thank you for going over time because I know I know discipline and time frames and everything are very important, you know, in the lifetime mm -hmm. the lifestyle. So you mentioned having a high feeling back in the in the early days after you had sex. You really experienced the high feeling, and so you had to get control of yourself so you didn't let it turn into a sex addiction. Can you talk to me about having sex from a wholesome place? How you feel when it's over? versus when it wasn't when you were getting the high feeling i want to i want to hear more about this high feeling that you got from sex because that tricks a lot of people into thinking that what they're doing is helping them when really it isn't well it's interesting because after spending so many years single and having like these unattached experiences when i started dating my husband i had a very hard time having like normal intimate sex with him it freaked me out and he was like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm used to getting like fucked and just like hardcore. Like we had to learn to train my body to like receive pleasure in like a romantic way again. It was very bizarre and very weird. And now obviously we have no problem with intimacy, but that's what I mean about finding balance. You can do some damage by only focusing on one thing and not being like well-rounded in your sex life if you're only having unattached sex you're only having rough sex you know even if like you're always using a toy like a vibrator or something at some point like your body is going to be like i need that i can't function without it i don't know how to get pleasure in any other way so you want to make sure that you are kind of mixing it up sometimes and making sure that you're not losing any facet of sex because you're so into one 
What was your original question, though? Sorry. I mean, I think that pretty much covered it. We were talking about like the, like the high feeling that you get, but like you know what what you were saying basically is is the truth. It's the whole truth. It's the gospel truth. Actually, that everything we do in this life conditions us. In the hypnotherapy mm -hmm. world, we call that like neurological pathways that are being formed. We're training ourselves how to be, and so people who are just totally random and 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 just basic with the way they go about it fuck themselves up. I've experienced this in relationships that I've had in the past where the dude could only fuck, you know, only have sex in a hard way. And I had to do the same thing, try to slow them down. Like this is called love making yes. something that happens when you're in a relationship. This ain't grinder no more. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's like they can't, it's like they thought they were just going out having fun and they didn't realize that they were training themselves to just be exactly. stuck. So you need to be careful. And then they could not transition well into being in, in a relationship. And some don't, unfortunately. And I mean, they just stay in that hoe mode. Yeah. <laughs> but now, like, I can get that high from, you know, going to a gangbang with 10 guys or from making love to my husband when I want. Like, I've learned how to get that back. And they could be equally as powerful at this point. And that's really important. And you all, you all have variety. And you all have a real rounded lives. Like you said, the people who you meet up with, they have careers, you know, they're taking vacations, they are creative in their arts, you know, they're going forth in their giftings, they know who they are, and they're also super sexual. Too many times I see people who are, don't really have a lot going on in life, but my God, can they go out and get laid? It's mm -hmm. like, we need, we need a little bit more from you than just sex. Like we got to have variety and any addiction can cause, can cause a person to fall out of balance, be it drugs, porn, social media work whatever can cause you to focus way too much on those on those few things and not have enough variety in life you know we need variety people there's a whole lot of things you can do in this world yeah so for me i would say being in a relationship with the right partner though not the wrong partner the right partner has been really good for me to maintain balance because when i was single i didn't when i was single in the lifestyle i wasn't really dating vanilla anymore so my whole social life was dedicated to the lifestyle so i was out five six seven nights a week sometimes like in the lifestyle now obviously me and my husband have a very busy life we have like other things going on so it, it cuts back a little we're still active but i can't go overboard because he keeps you know we keep each other in check and that's good for somebody like me if i was still single i don't know what i'd be doing right now but i like having that separation between real life and the lifestyle because it used to be very, very blurry to me. Yeah, I'd be open to that. I wouldn't mind having a boyfriend, maybe a girlfriend or a boyfriend, and then we open and explore if he wants to be monogamous, whatever. But I do understand that having that primary relationship is super important or somebody who, you know, I, you know, I go to. So again, throwing it out there for all of you who are listening. Yes, yes. And so let's talk about your three books. The first one... I'm going to say the name of all three. In Bed with Strangers, Swinging My Way to Self-Discovery by Casey Donatello. The second one, Scarlet Swings Higher, The Sexual Saga Continues, also by Casey Donatello. Scarlet Surrenders, Swinging into Love, also by Casey Donatello. <laughs> so this is like a part one, part two, part three. I'm happy I was able to get such a chuckle out of you. So that was very dramatic. I loved it. That was a better intro than I could do. So I love it as part two. Thank you, my darling. So it's part one, part two, part three. So it's like a continual series. Is there anything that you would like to, to say about any of these, these books? So it is chronological. The first book gives a little bit about me before the lifestyle, how I got into the lifestyle, and then me trying to find my footing like while I'm single. Second book is... I've kind of got a hand on things now, and I discovered that I love multiple guys, gangbangs, all of that stuff. I'm still struggling with having a relationship. And then part three, I meet my husband, and we end up getting married. So those are the three books. So they're, the last one ended, I guess, like two years ago. Yeah, we've been married for two years. So I felt like that that would um demonstrate a lot of people's past going from you know recklessly sexual or trying to figure it out 
to finding peace and balance because that's really what we all want. You know, it's nothing wrong with stumbling and crawling before you learn how to walk. And so I love the fact that you've been so transparent to show your mistakes and errors and now yeah. you're But the most important thing is everybody wants to like talk about sex, like how fun it is and how great it is. And no one wants to talk about like what can go wrong and how it could have like a negative impact. They just want to talk about the fun stuff and that's so unrealistic. And, you know, if people can learn from my mistakes or learn from, you know, things that I've said or I've done, then that's wonderful because it will help you a little bit. But if you're not going to talk about things honestly and be real, like in my books, sometimes the guy's the asshole, sometimes I'm the asshole. And I admit that, like, I fucked up a lot of stuff, you know, I am not perfect and that's okay. But we want to be honest about that. We want to, you know, be transparent and not sugarcoat stuff and like we're amazing all the time and we know all the answers because that really doesn't serve any purpose, you know? No, it doesn't. I also would add that there's also diseases and stuff out there that can come about depending on what you're doing. There's cures and fixes for most things, but there are still some things that people tend to get a hold of. And it goes like that didn't get a hold of that might not be so easy to banish. Mm -hmm. There's one dude that I that I had met off of an app ages ago. Some I don't know what the fuck was going on with him. Some some shit backtracked or got into his fucking kidney or some shit like that, you know. And it, and he he had to like go away to like a hospital or some sort of some kind of way. He had to like yeah. leave leave the city, like. And then with HIV, especially in the queer world, there's a lot of HIV. Don't forget. You can still contract other strands of that, and there is a specific special term for it. It can crossbreed your HIV, and it could fuck you up so that your antivirals don't work anymore. These things might be rare, allegedly, but the point is, if it happens, people are not going to go into the sex apps and say that. They're just going to disappear, act like nothing happened. Like you said, nobody talks about the bad side of things, but bad shit is still happening out here in this world where people like to go have all the sex with each other. I know we are super, super strict about condom use. Even if people show us test results, I don't care. Like, you know, not worth it to me. Because again, like anything can happen. A condom can break or whatever, you know. But that's very, a small percentage compared to just not even trying. And there's a ton of people in the lifestyle that only have bare back sex. And that's fine for them. But we don't engage with those people. I don't believe in that for myself, you know. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. You can do whatever you want. But for us, we feel like we're going to at least try to be as safe as possible. I'm on the pill. So, you know, there's that. But we definitely use condoms all the time. And I hate when people try to pressure us to not use them. They come, like, with their results. I go, that's fantastic. Like, I don't care about your results. I'm glad you're clean. But that doesn't mean you don't have to use a condom now. You know, but I do think people in the lifestyle talk about testing more than vanilla people do i've never had a vanilla guy show me his test results but in the lifestyle we post it on our profiles like we talk about it we discuss if we're going to use condoms with people beforehand whereas on a vanilla date i don't remember ever having conversations about safe sex like you expect people to use condoms but you didn't really talk about it before you got in the bedroom at least in my experience so Safe sex is also a little more easy to discuss with people in the lifestyle. I would say it's at the forefront because since we are so sexually active, we think about it more and we try to be as safe as possible. But I tell people, you can get an STD the first time you have sex in the vanilla world, right? You fuck one person that has something, that's it. So it's not like you can only get an STD if you're in the lifestyle and you're promiscuous. It could happen anytime, any place, anywhere. And again, what are you doing to keep yourself safe? <clears throat> but there's no guarantees in life. Right. And even with test results, those test results are only good from the date that the blood was drawn. So if they That's went... what I mean. People will bring us a test result from two weeks ago. I go, how many people did you fuck in the past two weeks? <laughs> so it's not like it's a nice thought. And at least we, we get tested regularly too. But that's meaningless to me. Like, And even if you got tested that morning... I feel like a condom is a sign of some, it's like symbolic. Like you need to earn the right to fuck me without a condom. You know, I don't think that's like a casual hookup thing. And again, this is my personal view. Other people will disagree completely and that's fine. 
But for me, you need to earn that. So like my husband and I always talk about the fact that we would love to find a guy that we're friends with that could fuck me raw so they could like both come in me and all this stuff. But it's been four years. We haven't found the right person yet because we take it so seriously. You know, like that's a big honor, I think, especially when it's somebody's wife now that you're getting to fuck without a condom. Like I really take that mentally seriously. So maybe one day we'll find somebody. But until then, it's condoms for all. Yeah, our bodies are very special and it it saddens me the way people just kind of like fling them about without any kind of conscious thought. I also wanted to say before we get before we get over to our dad joke section that even with test results, there's like delays in terms of like the amount of time it takes for viruses to show up on test mm -hmm. results. Somebody could contract say HIV or hepatitis in January, it may take till June or November for that shit to show up, even though that virus is already in their system. And mm -hmm. so there's, there, there's a, it's a lagging indicator. So test results don't tell you necessarily what's living inside of somebody's body. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how pretty the body is or how, how attracted you are to it. What's living inside that body could kill you. Yep. So I also wanted to mention that this girl offers ghostwriting services too, which all of that is on her website, CaseyDonatello.com. Like I said, she does it all. She can help you write your book. If you want to express yourself sexually in some sort of way, she can do that too. She is here to service you, my dears. She is here to service you. <laughs> that sounds very submissive. <laughs> well, let's see. How would you flip it around and make it not sound submissive? Help you fulfill your fantasies. She's here to guide you. There you go. That's better. <laughs> That's better. You're here to guide you. Or do you usually like to be on top when you're having sex with guys? Is that, is that how you maintain your power? How do you maintain the power? Is it because you're telling them what to do or how is that? It depends. I like, I like everything. Mm -hmm. I think that like, some, for me, submissive is more of like an attitude mm -hmm. than anything else so like people always laugh at me because i could be in a leash and collar you could be holding the leash but i don't feel submissive like because i'm at, i'm still acting very powerful and dominant with a collar on like i kind of i'm somewhere in the middle but a lot of things i do people look at me and they're like oh she must be submissive but i don't think i'm submissive at all i'm very dominant and i have no problem being in charge when I'm in like handcuffs and a blindfold, I'm still going to tell you what to do. To, you know, I just think, you know, toys and bondage and all these props and stuff are fun. But I wouldn't say like I'm really into dom sub stuff with my husband, sure. But with other people, I don't even look at people in those categories. I think I like aggressive guys because I'm aggressive. I want people that are fun and energetic and not shy. So I don't really feel like there's this, like, I don't know, this difference. Of, I think we're all on the same playing field and whatever happens, happens. I just like sex to be fun and like in your face and I like to experiment and explore. But yeah, I would never call myself submissive. <laughs> I know that's right. Look, I'm, I'm here for power woman. Be powerful. I think y'all should run everything. Just run shit. The world would be a better place. <laughs> okay. So today's dad jokes come from goodhousekeeping.com. I always like to do some dad jokes to kind of lighten the mood at the end. Well, this has been kind of like a bubbly conversation overall. And Is it like a riddle and I have to guess the answer or you're just telling me the answer? Mm -mm. So a dad joke, I'm going to ask the, the versions that I pose are the actual question kind and, you know, and they're just like corny ass fucking jokes okay. <laughs> that are not meant to be like. I love corny jokes. so And I love puns. Right, right. So let's see. Why did the bicycle fall over? It didn't have a leg to stand on. I don't know. That, would, <laughs> that, that, that could work. But like, you, you're so like. You're, I know you get at least one of these, but it's it's it, it's because it was too tired. Oh, that's a good one. Too tired. Okay. <laughs> these work better sometimes if you've had a little bit of weed or an edible or a cocktail. No, like I love I love bad jokes, so this is perfect. 
Okay, why was Cinderella so bad at soccer? Because she lost her shoe every time she kicked her foot. <laughs> I don't know. She kept running away from the ball. Uh, I get points for like creative answers though, don't I? Ask the fucking lootly. Ask the fucking. I have a good sport, you know, good sportsmanship <laughs> here. Okay, next okay, one. Okay, you're going to get this one. This is the last one. What do lawyers wear to court? Briefs? You know what? If if I would like, that's a great answer. Come on, that is, that is a great answer, especially considering the world that you're in. Absolutely, yeah. you know. I'm, I'm going to yeah. consider this as like one that you got. I'm going <laughs> to consider this one that you got. I love that because it's it's perfectly interchangeable. The answer that I looked up was lawsuits. But okay, but they could have briefs they're, underneath their lawsuits. So. Absolutely. They were briefs under the lawsuits. I definitely get a point for that one. Absolutely. And I love, I love my fucking attorneys. I keep them around. So her website is caseydonatello.com. Her OnlyFans is Hot Wife Life 869. She's also on Twitter, Hot Wife Life 869. All of this will go in the showy notes. Casey, is there anything that you would like to say? You can get to have, have the last word being the powerful, dominant woman that you are. I think you need to, I need you to close out the show. Okay, that is a lot of pressure. I wasn't accessing that. Any words that hurts me? You can say anything you want or nothing at all. You don't have to. I would just say be bold enough to explore what you want to explore and smart enough to do it in a safe, a safe way. That's all I got. You know what? And that's the fucking tea. Thank you so much for coming on the show, girl. We will see you next time. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you all so much for joining us today and for taking some time to invest into yourself and into the lives of your loved ones. Please visit us at sexdrugsandjesus.com and check out our resource page, our spiritual service offerings, my blog, my books, and other writings that God has partnered with me to create. Find us on any social media platform. Stay strong, my people. And just remember that everything is going to be all right. <laughs>